Hi, so welcome everyone to this edition of Precision Nanosystems Tea Time webinar. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to host uh, Professor Yvonne Perry here, who is going to talk to us about the manufacture of LMPs for RNA delivery uh, from considerations uh, of payload to process design. Yeah, so just briefly to introduce the European team here. Uh, so on the sales side, we have Jürgen schmidt schotig uh, covering uh, European Central Region and Suha Zwein uh, covering the European North and South Region. So uh, please, please reach out to either for uh, commercial activity in your area. And then covering uh, technical aspects of precision nanosystems uh, offerings across Europe is myself, uh, my colleagues, Martin Rabel and Sarah Gherkin. Uh, so please, again, feel free to uh, reach out to us with your technical questions with respect to PNI's offerings. Uh, and over to you, Yvonne. Perfect. Thanks, Edward. Yeah, and thanks for the kind introduction and the opportunity to share what we've been doing here at Strathclyde. So, as Edward says, we've been looking at all the aspects of the manufacturing process from considerations of the payload we use through to the process that we apply. So, just to give you an overview, I'm sure most of you are very familiar, but the process we adopt is the manufacturing using microfluidic processes, where we're basically doing that solvent dilution, which causes the nanoprecipitation and the formation of lipid nanoparticles. We then do purification to remove the solvent, either by cross flow filtration, or if we're in a hurry, we'll do a spin column as well. We then obviously monitor all the CQAs that we're used to. We would apply sterilization before we have our product. So if we look first at our production process, with the all microfluidic uh, processes, generally you've got two considerations. You've got the ratio you mix your solvent to your aqueous, and you've got the speed you run the system. So within that, there is other options to consider. So with a solvent, obviously you get your choice of materials. So which solvent do you use, your lipid concentration, and also your buffers. And we can see a bit more about that. As I say, the critical parameters, the process, the speed, how quickly you run it, and also that lipid combination we'll see has an uh, impact on that. And then there is our critical quality attributes. And for us, with this the LMP space, we're looking at size, zeta potential, uh, the lipid yield we sometimes look at, loading, release, and efficacy. So those are your standard parameters. So we track those. So if we work through those, if we look first things first, the choice of solvent. So what are you actually dissolving your lipid in? So as we know, ethanol is a go-to solvent. We use ethanol because it's a class D solvent. It's got nice, uh, good ICH limits. But the other thing to consider, it does have to be miscible and have polarity. So we need to be able to dilute out the ethanol so that we get that nanoprecipitation. But what we do have to consider is the solubility of the lipids in this solvent. And with ethanol, the max solubility is around about 70 milligrams per ml, depending on your solvent, and you can push it up and down slightly. But that's with a standard LMP composition. But there are other solvents you can consider. And we wanted to just first look at that choice of solvent and how that impacts on our production processes for our liposomes and LMPs using microfluidics. So this is a standard LMP formulation. It's a Me Too copy of the LMPs used in the Pfizer formulation. So we are using diesterophosphatidylcholine, cholesterol, the ALC0315, and the ALC0319, I think, as so the Pfizer PEG lipid. So it's just a copy of it, but it doesn't have the Pfizer mRNA in it. So what we can see here is we've used three different solvents to dissolve our lipids. We've used methanol, ethanol, and IPA. And our bars are the size and our dots are our PDI. And as we know, we always want a PDI round about below 0.2 or as low as possible. So what we can see with these LMP constructs is with our size, we generally see no notable impact on size with the choice of solvent. We see no impact on the surface charge. And again, obviously, it's round about near neutral. We've done that buffer exchange, so they are now in TRIS buffer. And we also look at encapsulation efficiency, which are the bars, so we get good loading of our mRNA. And the dots are our mass balance or recovery, so you can see we are actually getting what we put in. And this work was done by Caitlin within our lab. So in terms of LMPs, the choice of solvent is not making a difference. So that's 
good. It means you can jump between the three solvents if you so choose. But if you relate that back to work with liposomes, and it's interesting because this has shown us that all the learnings we have from liposomes don't necessarily directly apply. What we see is if we make liposomes with methanol, we use microfluidics versus ethanol versus IPA, we can see that size increase. So you can see it in the cryo EM here, the size is particularly the IPA with two, sometimes three, four bilayers. But here you can see the size here. So the methanol ones are sitting around 45, 50 nanometers, stable over time. So this is something we can keep. The ethanol ones sit about 60 and the IPA ones sit about 90. So just that switch and so on does give us a bit more flexibility in controlling particle size for these liposomes. In terms of loading, and we, so this isn't mRNA, this is protein, because we wanted something that wouldn't electrostatically bind, so we could see a bit more. Methanol and ethanol gave us reasonable loading, around about 40%. IPA reduced it down, and we assume it's because these multiple bilayers and you've got less space to load. But in terms of release, and again, this is protein release, what we do see is they both, they all three have the same release properties once you normalize for their initial incorporation, uh, efficacy or loading. So you can control particle size with the choice of solvent with li liposomes, but not with LMPs. And we wanted to explore that a little bit more, that control in size. So by mixing your alcohols, a very popular thing we do in Scotland, you can actually fine tune the size. So methanol and ethanol, they were given LM, uh, liposomes roughly the same size, 40 to 50 nanometers. And you can get a small change in it if you bias towards your ethanol. But if you remember, our IPA gave us really big vesicles around about 90 nanometers. So by blending methanol with IPA at various ratios, we really can control that particle size as shown here, but our PDI is nice and low. So this is telling us it's not aggregates we're seeing, we are actually getting different vesicle sizes. So really that blend of ethanol to IPA, or sorry, methanol to IPA, lets us control size equally. If we blend ethanol and IPA, we get that size control but keeping our PDI nice and low. So we have an ability to control these characteristics. We also did look at cationic liposomes just to see again, was it to do with the condensation element of LMPs or was it the liposome construct? So we can change the particle size of cationic liposomes, so these are empty, by blending the ethanol. But what we do see is when we start to put PEG on the surface, so we've got pegylated lipid in here now, that effect of alcohol mixing no longer uh, transpires. So the particle sizes are all the same. And actually what you can see is as you increase your PEG content, now obviously with LMPs you're at a very low level, so there must be both the choice of lipid and the complexation going on. But with liposomes, definitely when we hit about 15%, we see this impact of solvent choice mitigated by the PEG content of the liposomes. So the kind of take home message is the different LMPs will, have, uh, will be affected by choice of solvent and different liposomes. So you really need to know which solvent you're going to use, methanol being your go-to, but if you have restrictions with solubility, there are other options, but they may impact on your particle size. So that was the, the alcohol. What about your buffer? So if we start with LMPs, we know the standard go-to for LMPs is our citrate buffer because that's what our mRNA needs to be dissolved in and then we switch it out. So we looked at 10, 50 and 100 millimolars. And again, this is Caitlin's work. So you can see really the particle size, it's bobbing around a bit, but there's no notable difference with molarity having an impact for us with this LMP formulation. They're near neutral again, no impact. And again, good high loading and good recovery of our uh, mRNA in this respect. So the choice of citrate buffer in terms of molarity is not impacting on our particles for LMPs. But we have previously seen that actually that does impact on liposomes. So we were making small uh, unilamellar vesicles that were cationic and we we're making them in 10 millimolar crisps. So when we did this, Particles were very small, they were about 40 nanometers, and these were originally one of the formulations we were looking at as a liposome to deliver mRNA. So with the low tris and molarity, we got small vesicles. If we really ramped up our tris concentration, 
we could create large unilamellar vesicles using microfluidics, and they were over 500 nanometers. So this is our difference in intensity. Again, two single peaks, so we have nice populations, different sizes, and it wasn't something that was to do with the buffer because we could then replace the high concentration buffer back down to the normal TRIS, but keep that size. So the point here is we can control particle size of liposomes just by manipulating both the solvent and the buffer that we choose. But one thing, again, it is dependent on your lipid combination. So these are liposomes made by DOP DOTAP, the old Felger formulation that we use to deliver DNA. And with TRIS buffer concentrations, you can see we can control that particle size. And here is the intensity plot. So it is a single point, And actually, visually, you can see the difference. Here's a low concentration, high concentration of buffer. With a different cationic lipid, diolodimethyl ammonium bromide, it's even more apparent that impact of concentration of your buffer on particle size. However, if you have neutral liposomes, they were, they were not impacted at all by this choice of buffer. So the massive of molarity of buffer, they're always the same. But in all the cases, that PDI, I, I go back to it, being below 0.2 at all times. So it's not that we're creating a, a mixture of products. We are creating something that has a low disperse, polydispersity index, but we are manipulating the size. And this work was done by Gustavo. So we've looked at buffer, we looked at ethanol. What about the parameters we can control? So mixing ratio. So this work was done with the PNI nano assembler. So we've adjusted mixing ratio so that we went from one to one alcohol. So this is ethanol to buffer, two to one uh, buffer, sorry, to ethanol and three to one. And at the one to one, we get very large particle size, very large PDI. So it's not a nice product. If you go two to one and three to one, that particle size comes down and levels off. Zeta potential is a bit messy at the one to one with these LMPs and loading is low and recovery of our uh, mRNA is even lower. So mass balance or yield. So really that one to one isn't a good one to go for. It's probably due to the high ethanol concentrations. But you can zoom in on that and you can actually look at integers. So you can look at 1.2 uh, buffer to ethanol, 1.3, 1.5, 1.8, and then the two to one. And you can see that nice size uh, control we have and comes with it PDI control. So roughly about 1.3 to one and above, we have a nice low PDI. If we zoom in on that, just to let you see that, that means we can have particles around about 200 nanometers round to about 80 nanometers with this uh, LMP formulation. Good PDI though. In terms of loading, again, if we go from about 1.3 onwards, we get decent loading of our mRNA and decent recovery. And as I say, at the lower ones, you start to see that problem with the aggregates, we think, and lower recovery. In terms of zeta potential, you do see more variability at the one-to-one -one ratio, which we tend not to use. But as I say, once we get to about that 1.3 to 1, which is where we gives us that size control, we have near neutral zeta potential. And the point of that is what is happening? Well, basically, as we mix out our ethanol, we're taking our ethanol concentration down. If you take it down quickly, things have to aggregate quickly. So they'll probably form lots of small ones. But if you take that ethanol concentration down much slower, you may get larger discs forming and then they form larger vesicles. So that's what we think is happening. So that's your one-to-one -one ratio. So it's taking time for the ethanol to dilute out. Your discs form slower, they aggregate slower and you get bigger particles. And say your 1.3 to 1, uh, sorry, your 3 to 1 ratio, your ethanol concentration is diluted out much quicker. Aggregation happens quicker and your particles are smaller. So that's us looked at the two compositions and the, the mixing ratio. So what about how quickly you run the machine? So this is us working with, again, the nano assembler and the Ignite. So we just looked at two uh, speeds, 10 and 20 miles per minute, the fastest we can run our machines. And we saw no notable difference on our benchtop equipment. And we've actually shown that scaling up to GMP and we can scale up with that using the same parameters. 
So that's the operation in a bench scale. What about your choice of payload? Because obviously now with mRNA, we've got a range of mRNAs we can look at, and we've also got self-amplified. So we've looked at a range of nucleic acid payloads from poly-A, which is a great surrogate. It's cheap, it's easy to use, and it gets you going through to mRNA, encoding for luciferase and GFP, and then self-amplifying RNA. And the key point is, for this table I'm showing you, is we start with very small nucleotide lengths, but we can go up to very large self-amplifying RNA. And we've che checked all those in terms of loading into an LMP package. And just if those of you are not familiar between messenger and self-amplifying, Basically, each mRNA molecule results in translation of one antigen, whereas self-amplifying has the replicants in it. So what you do is it's got genes of the alpha virus, it encodes non-structured proteins, and basically you get more antigen per payload. So you can the idea of this is we can dose down with self-amplifying RNA rather than normal mRNA. So what we wanted to do was check that LMPs, how easy are they as a platform to carry all these different payloads? So what we have here is LMPs uh, using the PNI Genvoy system, encoding, uh, loading poly-A, the luciferase mRNA, the GFP, and then we've also put in the MC3, which is the Ampatra formulation. And what we're really showing here is the particle size is always the same low PDI. So we kind of learn two things from this. Our LMP platform is versatile and we can package different things. And also poly A is a great surrogate to get going and testing. So our sizes are reproducible, zeta potential is reproducible, as is our uh, encapsulation of the different surrogates. So we can load poly A and different mRNAs, all equally effective using that. And this was done with the Ignite system. And that's quite important if you think back to the bivalence that we've all been getting as boosters. So if you think what we had originally with the Moderna was 100 micrograms of mRNA, and now what they've done is split it to 50 micrograms of the original Omicron, as they call it, and then 50 micrograms of the spike. And then with the Pfizer, we started with 30 micrograms of the original Omicron, and now you get 15 of the original and 15 of uh, the variants, which they have. So already we're seeing in these new vaccines, they are just taking out one mRNA and putting in another. So it's important we can quickly interchange if we want to make these LMPs a platform technology. And that's what we're showing here. So the next step, so we show we can do different mRNAs and poly. What about mRNA to self-amplifying, because they do get notably bigger in size. So here we have mRNA and self-amplifying RNA, and the blue shown here is with the Genvoy formulation, the lighter blue is with the copy of the Ompatra, which is MC3. And again, you can see particle size is reproducible with both M and self-amplifying RNA. So really what this shows is we can even increase the size from very small poly A, which is up to very large self-amplifying, the LMPs are happy to package up. They give us a near neutral charge and the high loading. So these LMPs can incorporate a very diverse payload in terms of size. So what about in vivo? So to test that, and this work was done by Edward, who nicely introduced me, and Natalie from PNI, who within the Strathclyde Labs. So we had mRNA, including luciferase. We had self-amplifying RNA, Coding luciferase. We took them into two different LMP platforms. So with the MC3, which is the Impatra copy, or the Genvoy a PNI off the shelf lipid combination. And we tried mRNA, self amplifying RNA, and both these. So basically, you've got four formulations you got M versus self amplifying, and you've got MC3 versus Genvoy. And what we did was we tried track them with fluorescence. So we fluorescently labeled the LMP to see where they went. And we also checked where expression was using mRNA or using luciferase. So this is the protocol we use. So as I say, we fluorescently labeled our LMPs. We intramuscular inject the mice. We use our IVIS system that we have set up here. And that allows us to track where the LMPs go using DID as a fluorescent marker. This one's a good one. It helps us see and also it tends not to disrupt the particle size. 
and we can see where the Lucifer rays goes and we can get images like this. So let's talk about this slide first. So what we have here is where the LMPs are going. So remember this yellow, it's basically imagine this is the where the LMPs have been. So they've been injected, we inject both legs with five micrograms of mRNA, but this colouring is the LMPs we're seeing. So mRNA and self-amplifying RNA. And what you can see, if you look here, the LMPs sit at the injection site, so this is at the leg, they sit there and they slowly clear. And it doesn't matter which LMP platform you're using, very similar profile. And if you look at S, self-amplifying and mRNA, again, that clearance profile is the same. So we've put different payloads in the mRNA, we've packaged them up, we've injected them, and once they're in the LMPs, the clearance from the injection site is the same. So we are seeing that same pharmacokinetic clearance of the LMPs. Then if we look at expression, this is obviously where we expect to see a difference. So with the mRNA, we see a rapid expression that clears off. And here's the mice here. So this is the same five mice measured over time. So with mRNA, you get that rapid expression, rapid onset, clearing away. With the self-amplifying RNA, it takes a longer time to come in, but then it peaks and goes down. And you can see that here. And these, these again, are the same five mice injected. You start to see the expression come up day six and day nine. So it's slow to onset, but we get it. And the other thing that's important to note is this is five microgram dose of mRNA, and this is one microgram of self-amplifying. So we've dosed down one in five. So that ability to self-amplify really helps us reduce the dosing. So that's great. You can see we can package different RNAs. Self-amplifying RNA allows us to dose reduce. This is protein expression, but what about vaccination? And that's the thing we're most interested in with this. So we use the SARS-CoV-2 as a model. So the mice were injected in day zero and 28. We collected blood at day 27, just before the booster, and two weeks after their booster. So here is a graph. So what we have is self-amplifying RNA encoding SARS-CoV-2 packaged up in Genvoy. Again, they've had a one microgram dose, so it's much lower. This is at day 27 and day 42. So we see that booster effect. So we then have Genvoy versus an MC3 LMP, very similar profile. So again, we see the response and then we see the booster. So what we're seeing from this is these both these LMPs are equally effective at packaging up these larger mRNAs and giving us a good immune response. This is our control. It encodes for luciferase, so you wouldn't expect any antibody against SARS-CoV-2, and that correctly happens. And then in terms of that balance from IgG, 1 to 2a in terms of that, we see a similar spread for both the Genvoy and the MC3. So both these LMPs have the ability to package up different sizes of mRNA and cause expression at the injection site and give us an immune response. So what we can learn from this, so LMPs, when they first ex exploded onto the market, one might say, thanks to the, the vaccines, a lot of questions were said, oh, this is great, we've nailed it. And it's true, we have got a flexible and accessible platform. We now see we can process control a lot and fine tune. We know we can scale, we've seen that and we speed up. And we know it's adaptable to the different payloads. So we have LMPs that incorporate a range of payloads, but give us the same pharmacokinetics, so really moving us to this becoming a platform technology. But this is, as a famous quote from uh, Churchill, so not the dog, but anyway, I'm going to attribute the dog because he's funnier than all. And as he said, this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning of where we are with the development of LMPs. And there's so much more we can do and so much more exciting research. So I'm looking forward to the next steps. So thanks, everybody, for your time and for listening. That's me. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the, your time, everyone. Have a great day and see you soon, everyone. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.